Bismillah and Alhamdulillah. My dear sisters and my brothers, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. As Eid al-Adha is coming closer, I received few questions in regards to this event. One of such is that if you are going to offer Qurbani or the Adhi as they would say in Arabic, should you cut your nails, should you uh, touch your hair, should you do this, should you do that? Uh, others, of course, other questions went straight to the point. Is this Eid all as it stands? Is it legit? Is it something that we are supposed to do? So these questions kept or keep creeping up every year. So perhaps this time I'm going to do a small talk. I try to keep it as short as or as uh, concise as possible and answer these and so many questions. Uh, for example, when Hajj did start and how was Eid at the time uh, the Messenger of Allah? And if it did not exist, why do we have so many hadiths that say so many different things? And so the certain questions, and please brace yourself. There are huge surprises in this uh, talk. And uh, let me first start by saying that the following, this talk here, and 99% of my talks never should have they seen the light of the day. They never should have been. Why? Because in an ideal world when we Muslims are following the Qur'an as, as they did at the time of the Messenger, nothing of these topics would have crept up. I don't need to speak about so many issues that I spoke about. And my talks, I'm not teaching you something. I'm just telling you there is another side to the coin of Islam that you hold in your hand and that side is in the Quran and I'm just trying my very best to bring the authority and leadership of the Quran to the forefront. So this is why I say in an ideal world this and many of my talks uh, would never have been recorded or shared or preached and they should never have seen the light of the day. But what can we say? We're not in an ideal world and between us and the messenger, there are 15 centuries, 1,500 years. So there is a long journey and so many things have happened in, those, uh, in this long period of time. And uh, the, the sad news is, through the, the, the amount of contradictions that exist is so huge. But what can we do? The sheikhs have given themselves limitless authority to add or deduct from Allah's Islam as they see fit for whatever reason they see fit. In Saudi Arabia, not long ago, not 10 years from now, they used to say, hey, at al amr bil ma'ruf and na'ana al-munkar, the body which uh, calls people to do good and forbids them from evil, or oh, that's how they call it. And guess what? This body had uh, not real police, they were not state police, but they were the religious police. They would walk the streets and once the adhan is called, any shop that is opened, oh, the, the amount of problems, it even gets physical beating. Why? Because they are implementing the laws of Allah. They're forcing people, even though the Quran states, la ikraha fi din, there is no compassion in the religion. But the sheikhs have chosen to ignore the Quran. And the consequence of that, look where we are at today. We can't seem to get our acts together in anything. Speaking about Eid al-Adha, I need to put forth certain elements so that we all are at the same level. As I said, the Sheikh took control of Allah's religion. They gave themselves limitless authority. So much so that a great scholar, at least in our Sunni world, called Ibn al-Qayyim al jawziyyah who is the student of Ibn Taymiyyah, between us and him, about eight centuries. And as you can uh, uh, guess, Ibn Taymiyyah is alive today, and they call him Shaykh al-Islam, which means the ultimate, the man, the Sheikh, with the ultimate authority in Islam. And what Ibn Taymiyyah says passes as Islam. You see... We mock Christians, we mock everyone else, we mock Buddhists, we mock everybody about how humans have changed their religion. And we forget that our religion also has been hijacked. Because of this limitless authority, the sheikh became so free, nobody challenged them. And guess what? 
in the years, in the centuries that have gone, we ended up with a pseudo Islam. Something that looks like Islam, but is not the real Islam that Allah wants because the Quranic Islam is far more interesting, easy, beautiful, less threatening, nothing of the sort. And I'm just going to mention a few things to you that the sheikhs have uh, corrupted so that you understand why, uh, because what I'm going to say about Eid later on, I need this introduction. For example, the sheikhs, uh, when, since the Prophet Muhammad died, until the civil war that broke out for about 10 years, uh, actually about 12 years, Muslims have been living under uh, uh, political status of Al Khilafa. Al Khilafa is the successorship. Uh, uh, the messenger died, Abu Bakr came after him, then came Omar, and then came Uthman, and then Ali. This is the Khilafa. However, in year 40, Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan came and he killed the Khilafa leadership of the political system and injected the the kingdom, he became the first king. Guess what the sheikhs did? They justified his deeds. And they went on. And since that day, until today, 1,500 years later, our president, look in the Sunni world, either you have a king, like in Saudi Arabia, like, like in this uh, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, all this place, you have kings, and kings is for life. Or you have presidents, like in Moro uh, Mor uh, Morocco's kingdom, uh, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, you have presidents. Egypt, you have presidents. But these presidents stay for life. They don't change. So actually they are doing the same thing as the kings. It's just they call themselves different. And who helped inject this disease in our society, in our Muslim society? The sheikhs. The sheikhs also confused people. On one hand, they say, you must obey the ruler, the king, the president. You must obey him blindly, even if he took your wealth and hit you and whipped your back. But on the other hand, they bring a hadith where the messenger of Allah said that if someone dies while defending his wealth, his family, he dies as a martyr. So you have two conflicting things. At one point they say this, and at one point they say that. Anyhow, so the, the sheikhs are in reality at the uh, service of the kings, presidents, rulers, and so on and so forth. Whatever the king decides, no matter in what direction, the sheikhs are there to find uh, the evidences. The Quran limits their hands. The hadith and the sunnah and all these things open a world of plausible things that they can bring in as evidences. That's all they say. Al-Quran talks about inheritance. So, if a man before he dies, or, or a woman who before she dies, she distributes her inheritance, good. But if they don't, and they die, and then Allah takes over, and what he does, he distributes the inheritance as is explained in the Quran. However, in Surah An-Nisa, where Allah talks a lot about the inheritance, they gave the male two parts of the female. In other words, if we have uh, a boy and a girl, the boy will always take twice as what the girl gets. And this is absolutely wrong. But out there in the Muslim world today, every Muslim knows this. To the male, the same share of the two females. So they understand it like, okay, if the, if the girl is going to get 100, the boy is going to get 200, regardless of their uh, social status. If the, if the boy is rich and the girl is poor, still. And they justify that with what? This is Allah's law. When in fact, in the same ayah, in the same ayah, not somewhere else in the Quran, in the same ayah, Allah talks about probabilities. He says, if there is one boy and one girl, the girl gets this, the boy gets that. Fine. If there are two girls and one boy, the two girls get this, the boy gets that. If there are more than two, then the girls get that, and the boy gets that. All this is explained in the Quran. The shocking truth is, when Allah says, وَإِن كَانَتْ وَاحِدًا And if it only is one girl and one boy, so we have one child, one female, one, boy, one man, yeah? فَلَهَا النِّصْفُ مِمَّا تَرَكْ She gets half 
of the inheritance. This part of the ayah is completely removed from the psyche of the Muslims. Nobody uh, the, the touches it. Not the sheikhs, not, nobody. They always stick to twice the, girl, the, 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 the man gets twice as what the female gets. And this is the problems that we are having today. Uh, let's move on. Uh, point number seven, when it comes to the belief in Allah, Allah wants us to believe in Him. Him. That's it. He creates everything. He holds us accountable on Judgment Day. This is a very comprehensive meaning. The sheikhs, they went on details. They, di they dived in until they said to us, and I had this even said to me, if you don't believe that Allah has fingers, then you cannot believe in Allah. You are a kafir. And so many people have been killed. Allah never asked us to believe in his fingers or in his hand or that he can run or smiles or, uh, or nothing. But hey, the sheikhs detailed these things philosophically and asked us to believe in them. And Islam got more complicated. People have been uh, qualified as kuffar, even though he prays, he says, like, Allah, and he does everything that we do, but he's a kafir. Why? Because if you ask him where is Allah, he will tell you, oh, Allah is everywhere. The moment you say that, you are kafir. Even though Allah in the Quran says, and he is with you wherever you are. And, this, and he talks to us humans, he talks to the fish, he talks to everything. But anyhow, so as I said, on day of resurrection, Allah states no soul will be wronged. Hadiths will say that on judgment day, when we, the believers, come in, Allah will take all our sins and put them on the Jews and Christians. And just like that, and this is in Bukhari, all what I'm telling you is in Bukhari and Muslim, it's very authentic. So like this, Allah says no soul shall be wronged. The hadith says no. Every Jewish out there and every Christian out there will be wronged. He will be, uh, will have, he will have all the sins of the Muslims on them. And uh, they invented adhan for salat. In Al Islam, we do not have the the adhan that you hear for salat. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Shadu la ilaha illa. All that, all that is man-made. It never was at the time of Rasulullah. Allah says. When it is called for, for example, it's time for Salat, somebody calls, hey, come, it's time for Salat. That's, uh, that's all there is to it. They invented the Adhan and look where we are today. Uh, in Muslim countries, four o'clock in the morning, the Adhan will rip your head out from your pillow because they want you to come to the Salat. Anyhow, they increased the number of Raka'at in our Salat from two to more than two. Maghrib is three and they added Zohar and Asr to our every Salat, every Raka'ah that you pray silent is a human added. Every Salat that you recite loud is what is what makes Islam. So, Zohar, it's all silent, that's added. Asr is all silent, that's added. The one Raka'ah of Maghrib that is added, that's human added. Aisha, the last two ones are human added. So you have the two of the early mornings, the two of Maghrib and the two of Isha. These are mentioned in Al-Quran. But they are uh, 1500 years, Salat as it is today became so grinded in us. Uh, ya Allah, uh, Zakat, Zakat, when you donate Zakat, Allah left it open to us. What Allah tells us is at the end of the year, look at what you got, donate in Zakat. And the zakat is donate until you feel you've done something good. And then when you do that and you feel something that you've helped, you've contributed, that is zakat. The sheikhs came in and they added all these things. It's 2.5%. Muslims didn't know the percentage at that time of the messenger. They didn't know that you have to calculate a nisab. You, you see how much uh, the gold is weight and the silver is weight and then you calculate a nisab. Is the, the lever, uh, is the level, the threshold of your wealth. I.e. if you reach this amount of money, you pay that. And if you do not, you don't do that. And all this is rubbish. Complication, beyond complication. So much so, that if you bring two of the most high learned scholars, and you ask them the same question about zakat, you will get two different answers. Because <laughs> they just don't know. Uh... Another thing, they handicapped half of the Muslim world. What I mean? They told you, if you eat with the left hand, shaitan eats with you. 
Okay, so now you eat with the right hand, right? And now the left hand, when you get to the table, is completely useless. If your child drinks with the left hand, you're gonna put it. Uh, some people they don't want their children to write with the left. If you are left-handed, then you are doomed. And guess what? Shaitan then looks with the left eye. Why don't we close the eye, uh, left eye? And if Shaitan walks on the left leg, we should all hop on the right. If we go with that understanding that because Shaitan uses his left for something, then we shouldn't because he's gonna do it with us. Guess what? Half of uh, the, the, the left side of us should be rendered completely useless. We should only uh, breathe with one nostril because the moment you bring with the two nostrils in our noses, Shaitan will breathe with the left one. But yet, because of the level of programming, we become accustomed to this. They forbade us, they made it haram for you to point with your finger. The sunnah is to point, to point out at somebody or at something with the forearm. Allah made wudu easy. Wash your face, wash your hands to the elbows, dry hands wipe over your head, and the same thing dry with the dry hand. You just uh, dip them in a little water and wipe over your finger, you just pass them on, the, uh, on your feet, that's the, 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 uh, the wudu. No, for us it's no. Why? Because 15 centuries, so many arguments, disagreements, so many people have, be, have had their feet cut off. If you do not wash your feet to go to Salah, they will cut off your foot. And they did it. They scared. Today we make wudu the way we did it because so many people have paid heavily for this to be, even, uh, even though Allah says no. When it comes to your face, wash it. Hands to the elbow, wash them. When it comes to your hair, just imsah. Is, is dry wipe over them with whatever left water because you are making wudu. And the same thing for your foot. But, and now uh, there's look at the wudu. Would you think it that when Allah revealed the Quran to people who live in the desert, that he will ask a whole city to perform wudu when water is scarce in the first place. The second thing is, if the entire people of Al Madina performed wudu at the same time to go perform, don't you think there will be a lot of uh, uh, mud uh, around the city? Don't you think that water will be all around? And at that time, they didn't have, the, the streets were not paved. Nothing was. It was just uh, earth dust. It would have been, it would have been turned into a chaos. Just see the Muslims when you go to the masjid, the, the amount of water in the, the wudu place. But you see, our sheikhs brainwashed us and so many things. But anyhow, supporting the oppressed is a divine command. In other words, when a country, even Muslim or non-Muslim, has been attacked and this country whom either they are our brothers in religion or they are neighbors or we have a pact with them if they call you to help and support them we must help and support them unless we have a treaty with the oppressor and the transgressor on the other party and the other party has launched a war based on arguments then it's none of our business you sort it out between yourselves but if we don't have a treaty with the third party and if the third party is an oppressor and a transgressor we must intervene look at our children and civilians and poor people in gaza today they've been murdered by the zionist and the, 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 the israeli uh, machine the war machine and you have sheikhs in Saudi Arabia that make haram marches in the streets, that make haram. And, and uh, I've heard it with my own ears. The sheikh uh, in Mecca is making, is giving the khutbah, loudspeakers and thousands of people and at home, uh, only Allah knows how many millions listen to his khutbah. And he says, when Muslims go out on marches, these marches are haram because in them, people you'll see women and men mixed up together and this will anger allah and allah will not curse this sheikh curse the religious machine that we have today they are servants with the government in egypt they cannot speak nobody speaks against the zionists why egypt gets financial help from america from israel every year Talking will make them lose that amount of money. So they let the Jews do what they want. Saudi Arabia and everyone else, the same thing. 
But anyhow, eating with spoons and knives have been deemed haram for centuries. And eating with fingers is the act of sunnah and this pleases Allah. Poetry has been written, hadiths have been mentioned. And guess what? All this is a hoax, it's a lie. The funeral prayer. As I have already explained about this in my talks, please go back to it when I spoke about the funeral prayer and that it is to differentiate more between people than anything else. Once somebody dies, we put them in earth so that the body gets back to the, its origins. The soul of the human being gets taken somewhere where it sleeps until judgment day and of it. There is no such a thing as Muslims symmetry. There is no such a thing as Muslims cannot be buried in, uh, alone long Jewish or Christians but the belief comes in from another wrong belief and that is when a Muslim dies he will live in his grave he will enjoy life in his grave and if you put a Jew or a Christian or another disbeliever next to his grave the other disbeliever is going to be punished in hell and because of that it will affect the Muslim and that is why we only Muslims get buried alone in the and this is rubbish This is rubbish. We all know when we go to the grave, nothing happens to us. We're not punished. Punishment will take place on judgment day after accountability. And then if your actions are heavy, the good deeds, you go to paradise. If your actions are light, you go to hellfire. That's when punishment starts. And that's how the Quran got ignored and everything else is today living in the psyche in the Muslim. Allah has said that in the Quran that we must not differentiate between any of his prophets and messengers. Guess what? Our sheikhs have put the messenger Muhammad above everyone else. And they praise him like they praise nobody. In fact, uh, yesterday morning, I read a post in uh, YouTube and it made my heart, uh, my blood boil. Uh, because the amount of shirk association to Allah is 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 flagrant is 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 there it's, it's so much i wrote an answer and of course the person got mad at me how can muhammad who a, a human being who died 14 or almost 15 centuries ago how can he today help you solve out your problem how he's dead but but the, to muslims today believe me it's in the culture of muslims in egypt they will tell you when nabi I swear by the Prophet. And the, um, the amount of shirk today is exist, exist. Yes, the Christians say Jesus is the son of Allah. We don't say Muhammad is the son of Allah. But everything else the Christians say about Jesus, Muslims say about Muhammad. And this is, uh, but anyhow, they force women to cover themselves when praying alone at home. The question is why, my sister? Why do you cover your hair when you pray at home? What? <laughs> Who's going to see you? Allah, <laughs> Allah sees the, the, the smallest atom of the cell in your blood. Allah doesn't. Allah is not affected by what we wear in salat and things like that. And they tell you, oh, or sometimes they say, you know, it's for the woman so that she can feel humble. I'll tell you something, yeah. If I need to 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 be clothed in certain way to feel humble, then I have a fake humbleness. What I really have is I am affected by by what I'm wearing. That's it. But hey, uh, Muslims women today, when they go to pray, she's alone at home, nobody to be there. She still covers herself and prays. And if she one day decides, yeah, that's, I've got enough of this, I need to pray as I want. Yes, I dress nicely because Allah said in the Quran that we should dress nicely when we go to pray. Yes, she wears a nice dress, not a mini skirt, a nice dress and should stand there with short sleeve t-shirt and pray. No way. <laughs> she's not even... The amount of brainwashing is deep. Hajj is very simple. The sheikhs complicated it beyond belief. The reason behind Hajj is simple. Allah gave it in the Quran. The sheikhs completely ignored that reason and invented other reasons for Hajj. And this is the topic of our... Uh, and then comes uh, the Eid al-Adha again. Eid al-Adha, Allah said it for the people in Hajj alone. We, the sheikhs, not me, not me, but the sheikhs, have made it upon us as a universal thing. Wherever you are, you offer a qurbani, an udhiyah, things like that. Now, someone might say, yeah, they did all this. 
And I'm telling you, I wanted to keep the list simple and I'm already about 25 minutes in the talk, just about the corruptions that they made to Islam. If I was to sit down here and speak about the other things, I swear to you, I'll spend the rest of my life talking about these things, mentioning them day after day. They never end. You, you don't believe me? F fine. Listen to this. Allah in the Quran stated that some people from the children of Israel said that Allah created the heavens and earth and everything in six days. And then they said, and on the seventh day, Allah got tired and he took rest. He rested on the seventh day. And that's what the Jews call Shabbat. Shabbat is meaning uh, they don't move. You become inert. That's it. You don't move. Right? So, Allah has said in the Quran that the people who started this, Allah told us their story. And it is them, these people that Allah um, morphed them into pigs and monkeys. Fine. Not all the children of Israel, those who invented the Shabbat, the, the, this very particular. There are stories in the Quran. And Allah has defended himself many times in the Quran that he has created the heavens and the earth in six days and he never got tired. And it's not on 24 hours days. It's a period of time. It's billions of years maybe between a day and uh, another. And a day in Arabic, Allah uses it uh, for example, uh, uh, judgment day. Judgment day is not uh, 24 hours. It's a whole. Uh, Allah calls the, the. He calls it the last day. So the last day. So it has to be a day to be last. So that last day doesn't have an end. Why? Because it's it's the new life. It's uh, hellfire. It's eternity. So the day, the measure of a day, can last eternity can last few hours, can last few minutes, can last few weeks. But the Jews got it wrong in their understanding and the children of Israel and they said Allah created the heavens and the earth and everything in six days. Which is just, and that's why a lot of people don't believe in the Bible anymore because science proves that there is no such thing as creation in six days. There are billions of years. And the uh, Bible says, no, it's six days. And that's why we have uh, in Arabic, Al-Ahad. Al-Ahad is a translation of a Jewish uh, day, of the same day, which is Ahad. Al-Ahad means the first day. Al-Isnayn, which in Arabic literally means two. Al-Thulatha means three. Al-Arbi'ah means four. Al-Khamis means five. So these are five days of creation so we the muslims or in the arab culture they follow the jewish calendar and here is the kicker that i was telling you the jews believe that allah took rest on seventh day and they call that day sept a sept meaning inert it doesn't move that's what it literally means why we the believers have the same day in our calendar in english we say saturday but in arabic they call it a sept isn't it, isn't a sept a direct attack on Allah? Hasn't Allah cursed the people of a sept? But how did it end in our calendar? When we say la ilaha illallah, and at the same time we have in our weekly calendar a day which says that Allah took rest after he created the world in six days. And that's where the depth of corruption exists. You see, when something has been hammered into your head day after day, months after months, years after years, guess what? That thing will become part of you because the brain is very, you can affect it. So when we as a nation have had certain things hammered into the big mind of the uh, community, of the society and here as Muslims, generations after generations, centuries after centuries, then that something will become part of our reality, of who we are. They brainwash us, they take the brains from our skull, they put it on a washing machine, wash it and put it back. And then they fill it with what they want. And a great example of this is the Eid, Eid al-Adha. Ask any Muslims, why, is, why do you slaughter Eid al-Adha? And they will tell you the well-known story. 
Ibrahim and Ismail, they wanted to slaughter, and then Allah didn't want Ibrahim to murder Ismail, and then he gave him, uh, he ransomed him with another animal, Ibrahim slaughtered the animal, each year we remember this event, and we slaughter the animal, and we, are, and we be thankful to Allah Ta'ala. That's it. If that is the case, then why don't we celebrate the day Allah saved Nuh? Allah perished the people of Nuh. And why don't we celebrate every other instance where Allah saves other people? But the true story is, this is not the reason, or the at least why Allah said that we should slaughter uh, as a, uh, when I get to it. So, the, the, all these beliefs that we have today, they are taken from the Torah, from the people's book, children of Israel's book, from the Bible, in other words. Yes, it's, I will, I will, later on I will read you the, the things, and you are, you, as I said, brace yourself, there are so many surprises in here. So, as I said at the beginning, in an ideal world, every Muslim out there, believes that the Qur'an is the sole authority, is sufficient to lead and drive Islam. All you need to do is read the Qur'an to somebody, and if they don't speak Arabic, and they speak English, Italian, whatever language they speak, you just give them the gist of what Allah says, the person take what Allah says and goes away. Right? End of it. But we're not in an ideal world. Al-Qur'an alone not only has been accused of not being able to drive Islam, to, 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 to be Islam. It actually is deliberately ignored. When he was alive, Allah revealed to him the following ayah. وَيَوْمَ نَبْعَثُ فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ شَهِيدًا عَلَيْهِمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِهِمْ And the day we shall send in every nation a witness from among them, against them, i.e. because Allah sends a messenger to the people. The Prophet Muhammad was not sent to the entire world. He doesn't speak the language of the entire world. Prophet Muhammad was sent to the Arabs. But of course the expedition, the conquests and the invasions took Islam where it is today, but otherwise it should have just stayed where the Arabs were. But anyhow, so on judgment today, Allah will bring each nation and among that nation, Allah will bring a messenger that he sent. Someone is going to say, but the Buddhists don't have a messenger. I tell you, you don't know what Allah knows. So leave that apart to Allah. Allah knows what he's talking about. And then Allah speaks to Muhammad and tells him, وَجِئْنَا بِكَ شَهِيدًا عَلَى هَؤُلَى And we shall bring you, Muhammad, as a witness against these, against the Arabs. And then Allah sp states something. وَنَزَّلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابِ And we descended upon you the book, i.e. the law. تِبِيَانًا لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ A clarification to everything. And I want you to put 1,000 lines under clarification to everything. The Qur'an is clarification to everything. And then Allah states, وَهُدًا And a guidance, because it leads us to believe in Allah, Allah's day, and things like that. And a mercy and good news to those who submit to the Qur'an. The ayah is clear. If Allah revealed just this ayah, that should have been enough for us. The Qur'an, Allah was descended by Allah as a law and a clarification to everything, meaning everything we need to gain access to Allah's mercy is in the Qur'an. But the sheikhs have completely disregarded this and they say the Qur'an by itself is not enough to drive Islam. The Qur'an alone is not enough as an authority in Islam. And then they will come and tell you, how did we learn how to pray? It's not in the Qur'an. How do, how do you know how many rak'at are in Dhar? So they take something that the humans have invented to attack the Qur'an. And that is really a very despicable thing. This is why on judgment day, when Allah will bring Muhammad to testify against his people, the messenger of Allah Muhammad to testify against his people, the very first thing and the only thing that the messenger would say is this, Ya Rabbi, inna qawmi ittakhadu hadha al-Qur'an mahjura. And the messenger Muhammad shall say on judgment day, Oh my Lord, my people had taken this Qur'an 
as deserted. And the reason why he says this Quran, because on judgment day, Allah will put the book he revealed to the people at the forefront as standing right before and then everybody will stand behind the book. That's the law to be followed. So when Allah brings the messenger as a witness against us on judgment day, the prophet is going to say, Ya Allah, my people have deliberately, deliberately wanted to ignore Al-Quran. That's where we are today. And that's why we are struggling the way we struggle today. People are broke and poor and they don't have money to buy uh, the, the, the animal, the, the sheep to slaughter. And each year it breaks hearts. Imagine you broke, you can't sustain your family and you have three children. The whole neighborhood has bought an animal and only you doesn't have an animal. And how you cry. I remember when I was a little kid. And every year our dad would buy an animal. And I didn't understand at that moment why we're doing what we're doing. But one thing I understood back then is people will show off, will boost, oh, my animal is bigger than yours. And this is clear in the Arabs. They always want to show I am better than you. Time has come to put the Quran and to, really to start a Quran revolution. So that in 15 centuries from now, the future generations will rely on the Quran alone, not on these nonsensical hadith narratives that have been invented by humans to the benefit of humans. Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا كَانَ هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ أَنْ يُفْتَرَى مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ And this Quran would never ever have been authored except by Allah. It's not Muhammad, it's not nobody. Nobody could have made this Quran. And then Allah says, وَلَكِن Now Allah is going to speak about the Quran. تَصْدِيقَ الَّذِي بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ That this Quran is a confirmation of what is between its hands. This sentence is always translated wrongly. They said that the Quran came to confirm the Torah and the Bible. Now if the Quran came to confirm them, then we, okay, we can all believe in the Torah and the Bible because the Quran has confirmed them. The Quran says they are authentic. And then they tell you, no, 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 the Quran states that these books have been tampered with. But how can the Quran testify for them, confirm them? And which part of them is, and is, you see what I mean? It gets complicated. But what Allah means here is this. The authority of the Quran confirms that Muhammad is truly a messenger of Allah. When the Prophet used to speak the Quran and people knew no human could make up something like that, they know that the Quran confirms the, the messengerhood of the Prophet. That's exactly what it means. It means just that. And then Allah says something else. Remember when I told you put a thousand lines under that Quran is clarification for everything? Allah now says it differently and he says وَتَفْصِيلَ الْكِتَابِ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ مَنْ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ And the detailed explanation of the book, i.e. of the Qur'an, is without any doubt only from the Lord of the worlds, i.e. only Allah explains the Qur'an. And this is why the messenger didn't hold a, a tafsir classes, didn't have a, a weekly talk in the masjid and people would come to listen. He didn't do that. Prophet Muhammad was about his business, going to do what the humans do at his time. And then when Allah wants to communicate with them, Allah uses the messenger and then suddenly the messenger starts talking and when he starts talking he cannot control what he says because at that moment there his mouth is no longer his he becomes just a machine that reads the quran out and people understand that that is what allah says to them and then the prophet gets back to what he was doing it's almost like he's possessed and that's why the orientalists said that rasulullah was possessed no he was not possessed it's just how the revelation worked in another ayah, so here we understand the Quran details uh, is a, a clear explanation for everything. Who explains everything? Allah. In another ayah, uh, the, the, the ayah just mentioned is in Surah Yunus, that is Surah 10, and the ayah is 37. In Surah 11, just after it, at the very beginning of Surah Hud, 
Allah makes this blood chilling uh, declaration. He says, Kitabun uhkimat ayatu, a book, the Quran, which ayat, the ayat are the parts, are the text of the Quran. It's like we have sentences, paragraphs. These are, uh, instead of saying sentence, Allah says ayah, because it's, it's in itself is a magnificent miracle. Allah says, a book which ayat, uh, uh, the content, have been firmly closed in what it means. When Allah says an ayah, he says it in such a manner that it cannot be added to. It's closed. The meaning is closed. It's like stop. Stop is a, is a meaning closed. You understand that whatever you are doing must cease. Alrighty. So Allah says, have been firmly closed. And then, فصلت من لدن حكيم خبير. The ayah is concisely closed. And then, deeply explained from the one, i.e. Allah, who is the ultimate ruler and the well aware. So who explains the Quran? It's not Ibn Kathir, it's not Abdul Salam, it's not XYZ, it's Allah. And that's why when I say something, I always refer you to another ayah which explains that. And we move on. Another thing that I want to say here, in Arabic they use Al-Hakim, they say the wise. Allah is not wise. And we must stop this uh, incorrect definition of Allah. The wise person is the person who makes the right choice without having all the information about what they do. And it's almost like, and then the outcome comes positive, so he was wise in what he did. Allah knows what he's doing ahead of time. When you know, for example, yeah, when you know that if you uh, let uh, your food on the stove, you're cooking, if you put the temperature at 500 degrees, you're going to burn your food. So when you put it at 20, you're not wise. You're just acting on the knowledge you got. That's all. The, so Allah always acts on the knowledge he has. But however, there is a man who single-handedly has changed the course of Islam until our time. And until this, the Quran gains back its, its uh, position at the driving, uh, driving wheel, if you will, in the car, the Quran becomes the driver. We will always suffer what this man has said. This man was born in the middle of the second century and died at the beginning of the third century, and I mean Hijri. He is a Shafi'i, Muhammad ibn Idris, a Shafi'i, a young man who, a Palestinian young man who uh, at the beginning of his life was full of following a school of thought, Al-Mu'tazila school of thought, and then when he was caught by Harun al-Rashid, a leader uh, of the Abbasi dynasty, a very, very bloody, very murderous leader, when uh, and Al-Mu'tazila, the dissidents, those who did not agree with the governments, were not with uh, Harun al-Rashid, so they were against him. So al shafii was part of this group. He was very eloquent, very knowledgeable in his own school of thought. That's fine. For, for your information, the Sunni world and the Salafi world consider the Mu'tazila as disbelievers. So a Shafi at that moment there, he had a disbeliever title over his neck. When he was captured and taken to Baghdad for Harun al-Rashid to the king, and of course to be executed, people told Harun al-Rashid that that young man could serve you well because he's eloquent and he's got good uh, arguments. He can hold good arguments. Of course, Harun Rashid brought him. He, he he took care of him. He gave him money. Blah, blah, blah. And a Shafi'i reversed back. He he went back to the Sunni and he became a, a sheikh of uh, the, the government, scholar of the government. And because Harun al-Rashid wanted to do things, and the Qur'an does not allow for these things, Mr. al-Shafi'i came up with the most despicable definition that you will ever hear. It is this man alone, at the end of the second century, the beginning of the third century, who said that the sunnah of the Prophet is a revelation just like that of the Qur'an. That's it. The Sunnah is a revelation just like that of the Quran. And then he added, 
Of course, he says something that he contradicts himself somewhere else. He says, كل ما حكم به رسول الله فهو مما فهمه من القرآن. Everything that the Messenger of Allah legislated or ruled with is what he understood from the Quran. So now it's his understanding. So Shafi, you said it's a revelation. How come now it's what he understood? How do you how do you reconcile between these two different things? Well, the sheikhs after Shafi, who came later on, looked at these two elements, and when they saw they were contradictory, guess what? They worked hard at on how to reconcile these two, and they came up with another evil definition. They said, when the Prophet reads the Quran and understands something, and applies it, if it is correct, Allah will leave him. And that is how we know that it is a revelation. But if Allah corrects him, then we know that the Prophet has made a wrong choice and Allah corrected him. And that is also how we know it's a revelation. So in both ways, it's a revelation. And this is a very despicable thing because there are so many decisions that the Prophet made and they were wrong. And the sheikhs use them all the time. The Prophet did this. And they will tell you, oh, when he was at the battlefield, he picked up a place. And then a man came to him and says, oh, Messenger of Allah, is this a revelation or a choice of yours? And the Prophet says, no, it's my choice. And the man said, it's the wrong choice. We should go and camp there. And they always praise the man for doing this. But hey, again. Another day, another time, the people were working on their palm trees and they were the crops, you know, farmers. And the Prophet gave them a piece of advice. And it turned out it was the worst piece of advice given to them. Because guess what? The crops didn't come and everything went south. They didn't make any profit. So when they went and complained to the messenger, he told them, you know, you know your things better than I do. And my question to him, why did you open your mouth in the first place? If you know you, they know better, why did you interfere? You messed up their entire crops. You should have paid it because you gave them the wrong uh, advice. But no, we see, it, the power of the brainwash is despicable. My dear sisters and my brothers, the truth of the matter is Allah only descended one book, the Quran. And everything else apart from the Quran is man-made. And sadly, 15 centuries of programming, so much so that people today will tell you if we don't have the sunnah of the messenger, we cannot understand the Quran. And this is a direct attack on Allah. Allah has in the Quran so many times says that the Quran is easy to understand, easy to apply, easy to practice, easy, easy, easy. But today we say, no, 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 Allah, the Quran is difficult and we need Muhammad, what he did, what he said, so that we understand. And then when we go and look to what the messenger has said, we don't find uh, tafsir classes. We don't find that the messenger hold uh, circles to explain to people what Allah meant. Apart from the Qur'an, nothing is what it seems to be. And everything that you know about Islam is nothing but opinions. They told you you should enter the toilet with the left foot and you say this dua. And then when you come out, you come out with the right foot and then you say this dua. But they forgot to tell you that all is a lie because at the time of the messenger they didn't have toilets. They used to go to the openness, to the wilderness, out there behind a rock, behind a tree. They do their business and they came back. They didn't have toilets. Toilets were in the third century, over 250 years later. And the devil who invented this hadith will pay on judgment today. But these hadiths are in our books, as if the Prophet had his own title. It's, it's incredible. It really is. But anyhow, so w w let me go back to certain elements. I, I want to dive with you right into uh, the Hajj, because as I said, Allah revealed in the Quran, uh, the only one book, and in that book he explained to us what we should do. And on Judgment Day, when Allah brings the Quran as the law for us to be held accountable against. And I always give this example. If you are in England, where I am right now, and you have the highway code, when I drive, 
when the police stop me, they will stop between me and the police person is what the highway code says, the law in the highway code. The police is not going to bring the United States highway code, is not going to bring Australia's code, he's going to bring England's code. Because that's the code where I am at, where I live, and where I learn to drive, etc., etc. The same thing on Judgment Day. We Muslims believe in the Quran. Allah will bring the Quran. And that is the book he's going to hold us accountable to. The children of Israel, they have the Torah and the Gospel. Allah will hold them to that. The Buddhists, they will... Allah will hold each nation accountable to the book he sent down for them. That's it. So for me... And this has been going on probably 10 years or more, actually. Whenever I, someone tells me something, I say, where in the Quran it says that? I don't care. They get angry. They get mad. They, they accuse me. I don't care. Because what I care about is that on Judgment Day, when I am alone, face to face with the Quran, I do not wish to be part of those people that the Prophet will point at them and he says they have abandoned the Quran. I don't want to be part of that. And I do not wish to do something that on judgment day when Allah asks me about it, I can't answer for it. I can't tell him, oh, this hadith is in Bukhari. Because Bukhari on that day will not exist. Not the man, not his book. Remember, judgment day is when you will run from your own child. Mom, the kid you carried on your belly, the child you pained to bring him to life. The child you so many nights, sleepless night, you spent with your child. If he's sick, you don't sleep. And the next day you are completely messed up. You can't think straight. Why? Because you spent the night with your sick child. That child, with everything that you've done for them, on judgment day, he will ignore you. He will run away from you. And guess what? On judgment day, you will ignore your child and you will run away from him. On that day, each single human being will have a matter for him that they should care about. So for me today, that someone comes to me and brings me something that is not in the Quran, I will not apply it from here till the last day. Because if I can't answer for it today from the Quran, I will not be able to answer for it on Judgment Day. So, if now, let me start by the first shock. <laughs> if you haven't had many, that is the first one. When you ask, bring three sheikhs and ask them separately, when did Hajj start? When did Hajj start? We know that as Salat, as they say, yeah, because the Quran says Salat started the very first day since the Quran came down, as Salat was up there and Prophet was praying for them. For us, they tell us now Salat was in year 13 or 10 or whatever number when he ascended to heavens, which is all nonsense. And others, they will tell you Ramadan was prescribed in year two after the messenger went to Medina. And so is Zakat in year two. But when you ask them about when was Hajj prescribed, guess what? They don't know. They don't, they have six dates as to when Hajj was uh, prescribed on Muslims. And these dates aren't a month's difference or two months difference. Absolutely not. For example, yeah, they will tell you Hajj was prescribed in year 5 of the Hijrah, uh, i.e. when the messenger had migrated from Mecca to Medina, in year 5. And it was said in year 6. In Egypt, the High Council of Fatwa in Egypt, Al-Azhar, says the year 6 is the well-known, this is the most agreed upon and accepted opinion. Fine. And then they will tell you, but there are other school of thoughts, other scholars that say it's year 8. A, th a fourth group says, no, it's year 9. And finally, uh, the, the last group, year 10. So I have 5, 6, 8, 9, and 10. We have 5 years difference. The, the, the Egyptians, they say year 6 is the highly most accepted one. But if you go to the High Council of Fatwa in Saudi Arabia, they will tell you that year 9 
is the well-known and mostly widely accepted. And of course, they mentioned 5, 6, 8, 9, 10. But to them, it's year 9. So in Egypt, it's year 6. In Saudi Arabia and the Salafis, year, year 9. And in between these two, go for Hajj. Hajj. I'm not, it's not fasting. It's not Hajj. Is tons of people go from a land to another land. From Medina to Mecca, it's walking distance of two to three weeks. And it's not a small event. And they can't tell us when it started. And you want me to believe you in others' things less. So, uh, uh, this is just for <laughs> one Hajj. So, and, and of course, as I already mentioned, 15 centuries of continuous, non-stop brainwashing and programming of the Muslim mind. It's extremely difficult to open the eyes of the masses. Extremely difficult to make people, including the sheikhs, I had discussion and arguments and whatever you want to call them, between sheikh, with sheikhs and scholars, I, t I show them the evidences and they agree, but they remain inactive, they, they do nothing. Yeah, sheikh, you, you, you see what Allah says. He goes, yes, but why? Because he's been programmed to think a certain way. Even though, and this is an argument I use all the time, Allah considers anyone who adds anything on top of the Quran as mushrik, associator. You see, we believe in Allah. If we, if we give something that belongs to Allah to somebody else, then we have associated that somebody else with Allah. I, I explain. If we all believe that judgment day belongs to Allah, Allah holds people accountable on judgment day. Fine. When people come and say, oh, Jesus will sit and intercede for people. So here we've given Jesus part of what Allah does. We've associated Jesus with Allah. When the believers, Muslims, us, say that on Judgment Day, the Prophet Muhammad will come and intercede for people on Judgment Day. We've given Muhammad something that belongs to Allah. So what did we do? We associated Muhammad with Allah. The Jew says Moses and everyone says their own Prophet. The other one is Buddha, the other one is Krishna, and the list is endless. So that is the... So when the Quran says this... And we bring somebody else's saying and we put them with the Quran, we have made, we have associated the other party with the Quran. Allah tells Prophet Muhammad and He tells him, وَلَا تَكُونُوا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ And you, you I, and as a group, you and the believers, do not be of the associators, mushrikeen. The question then is, who are the associates, Ya Allah, that you are warning us of and that we should not be part of? We must not do something that's going to qualify us as associates. Allah explains, Of those who have divided their religion, their religion, and they became sects. Husband, each party of them is happy with what they have. And this one is in Surah number 30, Ar-Rum, the Ayah 31 and 32. So anyone who splits away from the Quran, creates an understanding away from the Quran, defines themselves as a party away from the other, and is happy with their discoveries, like the Salafis, like all these people, as far as Allah is concerned, these people are mushriks. No matter how they twist it, they are mushriks. Why? Because they split away from the Quran. After all, Al Quran is defined as As Sirat Al Mustaqim. The Quran is defined as the straight path. And as you know, straight path is one. But the crooked paths are many. And anyone who doesn't hold on to the straight path, has crooked away from the Quran. I stop here and I will carry on inshallah on part two. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.